exclusive tonight, an urgent warning about Canada's military obtained from the inside. This is borderline atrocious. An alarming assessment from troops to weapons and equipment, what internal documents reveal about growing concerns. A new push that could save lives in those crucial minutes during a heart attack. It could change treatments for cardiac arrest patients across Canada and possibly worldwide. And our investigation exposing how Russia is targeting Canadian technology for use in its weapons. Sources have agreed to walk me through exactly how they hacked a Russian arms maker. We take what we uncovered directly to the Russian ambassador. How do you account for that? From CBC News, this is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Thanks for joining us. We begin tonight with a CBC News exclusive revealing the alarming state of Canada's armed forces. We have obtained new internal defense documents that show this country will have a major problem if NATO comes calling for help. Recruiting is down and there are equipment shortages with major conflicts in several countries. The concern is Canada would not be able to meet its commitments. Tonight, we show you the shortfall straight from the military's own files. Murray Brewster brings us the exclusive details you won't see anywhere else. Canadian troops in Latvia, rehearsing for the nightmare scenario, a full-fledged war in Europe. Troops who would be in need of rapid reinforcement. And that is the nightmare scenario for leaders back home and detailed in the military's own assessment of its own readiness in documents obtained by CBC News. It begins with a warning. In an increasingly dangerous world where demand for the CAF is increasing, our readiness is decreasing. As of December 2023, only 58% of the military could be counted on to meet NATO's notice to move, and 45% of its equipment was considered unserviceable. The biggest challenge, people shortfalls and funding shortfalls, spare parts and ammo. The military is down 15,780 members. This is borderline atrocious. Experts say it's a crisis brought about by successive liberal and conservative governments kicking tough decisions about equipment down the road. Well, guess what? It's 2024 now, and most of those problems are now here, and they're, they're literally kicking us uh, in the face. The readiness crisis comes at a time when Canada is under pressure from allies and Republican presidential hopeful Donald Trump to spend more on defense. It impacts our credibility at NATO for sure, but it impacts our security interests too, right? Uh, it's in our security interests to be a credible contributor to NATO. The Liberal government insists it's trying to fix military recruiting and is investing heavily in new equipment. Even still, the Minister of Defense says things aren't quite there yet. My assessment is that we've got some work to do. So, Murray, it sounds like it's not just the military and the government concerned about this issue. No, Adrian. We have three separate public opinion polls out this week that are showing Canadians are becoming increasingly worried about the state of the military and Canada's place in the world. Now, one of those polls found almost a third of Canadians list it as their top concern. I mean, I can add personally that after almost 20 years of covering this beat, I've never seen numbers like that before. But keep in mind, the upcoming federal budget plans to cut $79 million from readiness for other priorities within the department, like buying equipment. All right, Murray Brewster with this exclusive reporting from Ottawa. Thank you. You're welcome. And there is breaking news from Ottawa as we come on the air tonight. Michael Spavor has reached a deal with the Canadian government over his detention in China. According to Radio Canada, which is citing two sources, the settlement is worth $7 million before their release in 2021. Spavor, along with former diplomat Michael Kovrig, spent more than 1,000 days in prison on accusations they were spies. Both Canadian men and the Canadian government have denied that claim, saying they were held arbitrarily shortly after Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou was arrested in Canada. And there's more breaking news now. We now know the Canadians killed in a plane crash on Monday night in Nashville were a family of five from Ontario. Officials now confirm the pilot, his wife and their three children between the ages of 7 and 12 were all killed. This comes as CBC News has also learned new details about the plane. Here's Thomas Dick. Before the plane crashed, killing all five Canadians on board and leaving mangled wreckage by a Nashville highway, 
that aircraft looked like this. The single-engine Piper plane seen here in pictures posted years ago by a previous owner. Now, CBC News has obtained the plane's recent flight history since it was registered to new owners in Ontario last July. The data suggests the plane was only ever taken on short trips within the province and once to and from nearby Pennsylvania. Then on Monday, with three children and two adults on board, the plane made two stops in the U.S. before flying to Nashville. By far the longest trip listed. And that stands out for this former investigator. It certainly seems like he would be at the low end of the experience scale uh, to undertake a flight like this, especially at night and over that long of a distance. After dark, the plane flies by a highway traffic cam, then crashes and bursts into flames. All of it less than five kilometers from an airport that the pilot had overflown, nervously reporting trouble to air traffic control. My engine turned off. I'm at 1,600. I'm going to be landing. I don't know where. Boy, that's about as big a challenge as you can have as a pilot. The plane was based here at this small airport near Toronto. News of the crash has left other amateur pilots shaken. When this type of thing happens, it, it affects all of us, and we all question our own safety, and we're all going to go brush up on our emergency procedures. U.S. investigators are expected to look at factors including the pilot's level of experience as they work to determine what went wrong. The National Transportation Safety Board tells us it plans to put out a preliminary report within 30 days. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. There is a lot of reaction tonight in Newfoundland and Labrador after reporting by CBC News confirmed a hospital morgue in St. John's has so many unclaimed bodies they are piling up in outdoor freezer units. At least 28 bodies are currently being stored inside the four containers located right beside the dumpster. The province's NDP leader is calling it unacceptable and wants the Liberal government to do more to help families on income support pay for cremation and funeral services. It's a funding issue. This is so self-evident and, and has been brought to the attention of government before and they've dragged their feet on it and here we have the solution is let's put freezer units there and simply add more freezer units and now let's build up a more permanent uh, storage structure. The health minister calls the situation disturbing and says a permanent storage unit is being built in the coming months. Well, CBC News has crunched the numbers and found that British Columbia ranks near the bottom in Canada for autopsies. It performs them at an unusually low rate. And as John Hernandez shows us, this is leaving more families with painful questions. I don't want anyone to go through this because it is heart tearing. This park is where Greg Sword would take his daughter Camila to when she was a kid. It's also where the 14-year-old went the night before she died. Sword says she bought Dilly here, a street term for the prescription opioid hydromorphone. My mom actually found her body at 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, she was curled up in a fetal position. And then when I got there, the cops were there and they would not allow me to see my daughter until she was in a potty bag. Based on toxicology, the coroner concluded it was cocaine and MDMA that killed Camila, but Sword wonders if hydromorphone, also found in her blood, factored into her death. And I assumed that they were going to do an autopsy, but they didn't. We got a variety of substances which were... This forensic pathologist also isn't convinced by the coroner's report. It could be explained by drug toxicity, but there may be other factors at play that haven't been assessed by virtue of the lack of an autopsy. BC's autopsy rate has fallen dramatically since 1991 to just 3.2% in 2022. It's a scandal. It means that we are unable to identify how and why it is our loved ones have died. The coroner's service says the rate is low because the number of overdoses is high. 
Alberta has a physician-led medical examiner system. It performed about 2,000 more autopsies than B.C. in 2022, despite having a smaller population. The man who founded that system says the problem is that B.C.'s coroner's service is run by lawyers, not doctors. It wants, it wants badly for medical direction. B.C. is currently searching for a new chief coroner, but the province won't say if it will consider someone with more medical expertise. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. Now to the United States and a new turning point tonight in the race for the White House. Nikki Haley is out, making a rematch between Donald Trump and Joe Biden all but certain. But as Katie Simpson shows us, Haley isn't falling into line and the Biden campaign sees an opportunity. Nikki Haley is not going away quietly. While admitting defeat at the hands of Donald Trump, she did not endorse him to be the Republican presidential nominee. It is now up to Donald Trump to earn the votes of those in our party and beyond it who did not support him. And I hope he does that. But Haley's last act of defiance may not matter. Trump's grip on his party is so unshakable, some of his harshest critics are now submitting including Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, the once powerful Republican who blamed Trump for the January 6th attack. There's no question, none, that President Trump is practically and morally responsible. The Capitol riot and all that's followed, none of it a deal breaker for McConnell, who says his Trump endorsement is for the good of the party. That I would support President Trump if he were the nominee of our party, and he obviously is going to be the nominee of our party. We need to find, and I think we can do that. Joe Biden's re-election team is convinced Americans will not be nearly as forgiving. They're now aggressively courting voters who backed Haley. Um, so if you agreed with Nikki Haley when she stood up to Trump uh, for things like election denialism or the chaos and division that he represents, uh, there is in fact going to be a home for them in Joe Biden's campaign. With the candidates in place, the campaign will intensify. An eight-month-long showdown that so many voters say they're dreading. I don't think anybody really wants to see this type of a rematch kind of a scenario playing out. I think people were exhausted the last time. It's going to be ugly. It's going to be embarrassing for our country. The campaign is also now shifting. After refusing to take part in any Republican debates, Trump is demanding a debate with Biden saying he's ready to go anywhere, anytime. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. The weapons supervisor for Alec Baldwin on the set of Rust has been convicted of involuntary manslaughter in the deadly shooting of the film cinematographer. Hannah Gutierrez faces up to 18 months in state prison. She was acquitted on a second charge of evidence tampering. In October of 2021, she mistakenly loaded a real bullet into a reproduction gun for Baldwin to use on set. He was pointing the gun at Helena Hutchins when it went off. Baldwin's manslaughter trial is set for July. To Haiti next, where a powerful gang leader is threatening civil war if the prime minister does not resign. As Sasha Petrasek shows us, days of violence have gripped the capital, putting the already unstable country into chaos. <laughs> Gun battles around the airport, fires and shooting on the streets as Port-au-Prince falls further into lawlessness, with the police outgunned by criminal gangs. Gang leader Jimmy Cherizier warns of worse to come. This will end in civil war and genocide, he says, if countries like the U.S. and Canada keep supporting Prime Minister Ariel Henry. The gangs were reinforced over the weekend when thousands of their members were sprung from prisons in coordinated attacks, sparking what's being called a criminal revolution. Henri is widely blamed for Haiti's mess. He took over when the former president was assassinated almost three years ago, vowing to go after the gangs. With Haiti's airport in chaos, Henri was reportedly forced to land in Puerto Rico after a trip to Nairobi, where he finalized plans to bring a thousand Kenyan police to restore order. If he goes back, I'm fairly certain that he'll be killed. So it wouldn't be bright for him to go back 
he's there's no government to go back to. There wasn't a government a week ago, and there's no government now. Terrorized by the gangs, many Haitians are fleeing the capital. The criminals looted and destroyed our homes, he says, forcing us to run. But many here also want Henri replaced. The atmosphere is currently very tense in Haiti. It's total chaos. People certainly blame the government as well as the gangs. They blame Washington and Ottawa as well. Haiti's two biggest benefactors seem to be propping up weak governments in Haiti, allowing chaos to rule. Sasha Petrosik, CBC News, Toronto. For the fifth straight time, the Bank of Canada is holding its key interest rate steady. So that rate will remain at 5%. That's in spite of inflation in this country easing to 2.9% in January, a number that falls within the bank's target. The concern now, making sure inflation keeps slowing and stabilizes. Because of that concern, the bank also made it clear it is still too soon to talk about an interest rate cut. But as Nisha Patel shows us, some families say they're simply running out of time. So that's our new total installment. Two years of high interest rates have hit the Dumichel family hard. We completely used up all our savings. We joined the food bank. We took the girls. We had two out of anything extracurricular. The mortgage payments on their dream home have nearly doubled. They lost steady work and could be forced to sell. It's just a combination of, um, of hardships right now. You know, like we can probably last for about three more months like this. Many Canadians like them are playing the waiting game, desperate for lower interest rates. The higher rates have weighed on consumption and investment and you have seen things slow down. The job market is cooler too and inflation has tumbled from its peak. But the Bank of Canada says it's still too soon for rate cuts. The assessment of the Governing Council is that we need to give higher interest rates more time to do their work. Overall inflation in Canada is at 2.9 percent, and some of the core measures the central bank watches are even higher. So interest rates will stay where they are until officials see more progress towards the 2 percent target. Even then, rate cuts could be slow. I think it's very safe to say we're not going to be uh, lowering rates at the pace we raised them. But those high rates are squeezing borrowers. In the latest quarter, missed mortgage payments climbed 52% compared to a year ago. Anyone facing mortgage renewal this year will see their bills jump sharply. We've been putting extra away specifically for that reason, to be prepared for rates of 6 or 7% even. I'm obviously hoping rates will go down this year. Um, it's hard to tell at this point. I think if they were to, to start decreasing, it would help a lot of people. The Bank of Canada gave few clues about when it could change policy, though many economists predict the first interest rate cut could come in June. Nisha Patel, CBC News, Toronto. There is new research underway that doctors hope will help those who suffer cardiac arrest. It could change um, treatments for cardiac arrest patients across Canada. The study into adrenaline and how much is too much. The movie about Blackberry's rise and fall makes Canadian Screen Awards history. I don't know what you need for your baby. You probably need like a nice pair of stroller, you know what I'm saying? And Drake gives the ultimate baby gift. I like a quiver in my lip and I'm like, oh! <laughs> We're back in two. A groundbreaking new study is underway across multiple provinces and it's aimed at giving patients the best chance at recovery after suffering cardiac arrest. Lauren Pelly now with how it's already affecting treatment in those crucial moments after a heart stops beating. When paramedics are racing to an emergency, they know cardiac arrest is one of the toughest calls. Every second and every treatment counts. Paramedic Elena Campo is taking part in a massive new study. Every ambulance is equipped with a study kit. Each kit directs first responders to randomly give a patient whose heart has stopped either a lower or higher amount of a life-saving drug. What we all hope to learn is the best possible treatment for cardiac arrest patients. In this case, it's the optimal dose of epinephrine. Epinephrine, or adrenaline, is a decades-old medication. It's given intravenously every three to five minutes. 
The drug works by squeezing the blood vessels, helping stimulate blood flow, which can help restart someone's heart. But scientists don't actually know the ideal dose. Researcher Dr. Steve Lin wants to find out how much epinephrine is too much. Well, there is some evidence that there might be very high doses can, can harm the brain because you squeeze the blood vessel so much that it starts to decrease blood flow to the brain itself. Is it okay if you take a look at this? Sure. A stopped heart can also cause brain damage on its own, raising a key question. Is there a way to optimize uh, survival as well as long-term outcomes? Lynn's trial involves paramedics in parts of BC and Ontario. The goal is randomly treating nearly 4,000 patients, a process that could take six years. Survivor Dan Shire feels it's worth the wait. When his heart stopped in 2016, paramedics gave him epinephrine. He now has lingering memory problems and welcomes more research. There could be a tendency that they uh, are erring on the side of giving you uh, as aggressive a treatment as possible to save your life that moment. Campo hopes the eventual findings give more patients on the brink of death a better chance at a full life. We know that this is a crucial study. It could change um, treatments for cardiac arrest patients across Canada and possibly worldwide. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Oakville, Ontario. A Russian arms dealer may be targeting Canadian companies to make more weapons. This is an STC document. Our exclusive investigation into how Russia is getting around sanctions. Sanctions in recent weeks have definitely expanded. Are you saying they're not hurting you? No, not really. And the growing fears among South Asian business owners in this country. So I looked around, I saw more than 30, 40 bullet shells all over the place. The extortion attempts that may be connected to organized crime. The National breaks down the story shaping our world. Next. Picture a cell phone and an email machine all in one thing. Nominations are out for the Canadian Screen Awards and Blackberry leads the way in the film category with 17 nods, including Best Motion Picture. The movie, which looked back at the rise and fall of the world's first smartphone, was met with critical acclaim. It's now the most nominated film in CSA history. I've been thinking a lot about my real family. On the television side, Little Birds up for 19 nominations, including Best Drama Series. There is a note on your file that uh, you have a sister. The show focused on a First Nations woman taken during the 60s scoop and trying to reconnect with her heritage. And finally, a shout out to our team here at The National, who received 10 nominations, including Best News Program, Best Talk Series and Best Newscast. Four groups in Nova Scotia are organizing land trusts in an effort to keep black communities together. As Shana Luck shows us, it's a chance to protect neighborhoods in the face of a housing crisis. Curtis Wiley is pitching his community on a new idea, and the response was even more than he hoped. So the room was, t was set up almost like how they hold wedding receptions here. They're debating a community land trust, where the land is held forever for the benefit of a group, and the group decides how to use it. They know they want to use land for affordable housing. Wiley believes if they don't do this, high housing prices will split the historic black community of Upper Hammonds Plains apart. I believe that our community would be gone, right? It, it would just be really fragmented. A group in Truro is a bit further along. Six plots of land in the historic black neighborhood called the Marsh are also set to become a land trust. Lynn Jones bought them so developers wouldn't. So that's not what I wanted. So the land trust was uh, actually quite perfect. And as Jones researched land trusts, she had a realization. And I was so happy when I did find out Oh, this was started by black people. The community land trust concept developed during the American Civil Rights Movement with the establishment of a 6,000-acre collective farm called New Communities, Inc. But it wasn't until 2015 the New Communities founders realized their model was being duplicated by others. Yeah, I was blown away. And that's when I learned that there were so many others in other cities 
using the model we created. In Nova Scotia, four black communities are now establishing fledgling land trusts, and all of them are very aware of the history. And I was like, wow, this is such a missing narrative, especially in the Canadian landscape. He's still spreading the story. So it was profound for me. And then it set me on a course of, of always telling people this. Looking for solutions in the past as the housing crunch affects his community's future. Shana Lux, CBC News, Halifax. Now it's time to dig deeper into the story shaping our world. The growing threat of violent extortion targeting certain business owners. And they were trying to say, we need money or we'll come shoot you in the daytime. But first, our exclusive investigation reveals how Canadian-made parts are targeted by a Russian arms maker. There is actually no Russian weapon without Western technologies. We have secrets uncovered in the shadowy world of Ukrainian hackers. And we ask Russia how sanctions are being skirted. We know that Canadian parts, and not just microelectronics, are ending up in Russian weapons. Ben McCoo breaks down how billions worth of Western technology supports Russia's war machine and the potential threat to your own future safety. These Ukrainian soldiers aren't shooting at Russian soldiers. Their gunfire is trained towards the sky, where one of their greatest adversaries approaches the watchful surveillance cameras of an Orlan 10 drone. These are Russia's eyes on the battlefield, one of their most vital weapons. And some of the electronics that put them up in the air don't come from Russia, but Ukraine's allies. So I'm headed to an undisclosed location here in Ukraine where sources have agreed to walk me through exactly how they hacked a Russian arms maker that's trying to source Canadian technology for its weapons. This is a Ukrainian hacker who is part of the cyber resistance, a group linked to secretive sections of the Ukrainian government. This is an SDC document. CBC News is hiding his identity for threats against his life. Big military companies, which works in Russia, are our top targets. So uh, SDC was on the top of our list. This is one of the biggest manufacturer of military equipment for Russia. STC, or the Special Technology Center, is a St. Petersburg-based defense contractor that makes Orlan drones and supplies them to the Russian military. The Orlan is able to jam communications and help Russian crews spot and target Ukrainian troops. The cyber resistance hacked the email of an STC employee and gave the cache of data to CBC News. Then we reviewed it. After analyzing it, we found out some invoices with the Western companies, suppliers, maybe even some intermediate companies who helped Russians to buy different electronics and equipment from different countries. Among them, two from Canada, Montreal-based tech companies Aimtech and Exfo. Both had their electronics appear on STC supplier lists of targeted foreign components. Nothing suggests their parts were knowingly provided to STC but doing so would be a direct violation of international sanctions against Russia. Today, I'm authorizing additional strong sanctions and new limitations on what can be exported to Russia. This is how we as a government can really have a strong impact. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in failure. At the beginning of the full-scale invasion, Ottawa sanctioned the Russian military-industrial complex, including STC, and issued harsh crackdowns on all exports of microelectronics. But Russia has been finding ways around them. Because drones are game-changers for both sides in this very modern war. So I'm at a secret Ukrainian drone training school, and even more than artillery shells or bullets in this war, drones are king. Before, military had to do the reconnaissance. It was always going by your feet, and it was very, very dangerous. Right now, we can use the drone, and you save lives by that. This is a Ukrainian drone operator, call sign VTOL, who was on the front line, but now he's a trainer. Right now, Russia is taking over the drones. The beginning of the war, of course, uh, we were ahead of them. But uh, 
they started to do it very uh, massively and they put a lot of money in it. M they have uh, more quantity of the drones that they are using. To feed that demand, STC appears to be sourcing Western electronics that Russia can't make enough of. Ukraine not only recovers Orlans in the battlefield, but they then forensically take them apart and find Western electronics inside of them. In every Russian missile, there are critical components from Western countries, dozens of components in every missile, and it's true, it's fact. They still receive the Western technologies to produce their equipment, including the drones that we are discussing right now. This Ukrainian military commander has direct knowledge of the hack. He goes by Serpin, and CBC News is hiding his identity because Russia seeks out officers like him to assassinate. Uh, EU, US, Japan, uh, and uh, other companies that belong to the countries, which uh, impose a different kind of sanctions against Russia. But as we can see, that uh, it's not so effective as it's described, uh, for example, for the majority of the population or the majority of the world. And experts agree. Because there is actually no Russian weapon without Western technologies. Olena Bilosova is a senior research analyst at the Kyiv School of Economics, who tracks Western components in Russian weapons. Her team says Russia and companies like STC sourced $22 billion worth of Western components for their weapons in 2023 alone, tracking 2,800 parts and counting. The key to Russia scoring these electronics, front companies and middlemen. As far as we know, uh, it can be sometimes up to five different intermediaries to get those components. And of those, she says a majority percentage come from Chinese distributors. To get answers from the other side, we head to Ottawa. This is the Russian embassy. Ben Maku, have a seat right here. Hello. This is Russian ambassador to Canada, Oleg Stepanov. We know that Canadian parts and not just microelectronics are ending up in Russian weapons, things like missiles and drones. Hey, how do you account for that? Uh, it's a globalized world, right? We know there's a global shortage in microchips, but those types of microchips also go inside of things like Kinzals and Orlan drones, stuff that your country is using and needs for its war efforts in Ukraine. Uh, the most advanced parts of Russian defense sector production have always used only Russian components. And uh, I will never believe that in a product like Kinjal, uh, any hypersonic weapon or nuclear capabilities. There is a um, outsourced uh, component. How about an Orlan? It's a very simple part of, uh, uh, part of technology. So it is possible that Western parts end up in an Orlan drone? It is possible, but not necessarily. I would uh, doubt that uh, my country uh, is uh, going to use or try to use or try to find uh, sources for that production um, in the West. I believe uh, in our defense uh, production we are quite self-sufficient. Sanctions in recent weeks have definitely expanded. Are you saying they're not hurting you? No, not really. Both Expo and Aimtech declined our requests for interviews, but sent statements. Expo says that it does not sell its solutions into Russia, but has no visibility to any potential alternate means of supply via other entities or countries. Aimtech says its products are neither designed nor intended for military or aerospace applications. STC did not respond to a request for comment from CBC News. What can governments do here in the West and in Canada to improve this and, and stop this problem from happening? It is very important to continue blocking that intermediaries and we exactly know who are them. To her, responsibility also rests on companies like Exfo and Aimtech to track who's distributing their goods. They should make their companies more responsible for uh, 
not only conscious supplies, but also unconscious supplies. Uh, this will, will force corporates to uh, increase their compliance. These electronics might seem harmless, but they're not. Do some of those Russian weapons with Western technologies, do they kill civilians? What message do you have for Canadians that will say, why is it important that parts from Canada are being targeted for use in Russian weapons and drones? And my message is that uh, if you close your eyes on the problem of the Ukraine right now, so it could be too late if you open your eyes and see the chaos, you see the destruction of your life much closer to your country and maybe someday it will come to your country directly to your home. So Ben, this is really interesting. I understand your military source in Ukraine is the one who gave you access to the hackers there. What happened when you met them? So we met them in a neutral building in western Ukraine and while I could see them, we had to promise complete anonymity. They also gave me something called a mirror, which is a duplicate of an email inbox of the SDC employee that was hacked. And I could see that some of the documents that I'd seen before were actually being exchanged back and forth. Okay, so you can see the communication. Uh, also, you, it's interesting to see that, that you spoke with the Russian ambassador. Uh, these interviews aren't always easy. What was that like? So as you know, these, in, these interviews are not easy to lock down. And actually, his press people got back to me within 15 minutes. Hmm. And when we finally sat down, he basically characterized the story as Ukrainian disinformation, but then eventually admitted that Western parts could be inside of the Orlan. Uh, but he did say that those types of parts would not be inside of a hypersonic missile or a Kinzhal. But still, any kind of admission is a bit interesting. Yeah, it's not only interesting, it's pretty rare when it comes to speaking to a Russian official. All right, Ben McCoo, thank you. An alarming number of South Asian business owners are being threatened to pay up. We need money or we'll come shoot you in the daytime. What police know about who's behind this, next. Criminals target businesses for extortion. We got a call again that now you saw the result, now get the money ready. The business owners are South Asian. The threats may be coming from overseas. A lot of gangsters are operating from jail. A growing crime wave sowing fear in various Canadian cities. So here's Jimmy Strachan to break down how those threats are made and where that's leading investigators. The car pulled up to the dealership in the dead of night. So they parked the car over there. So this was closed. So they walked under the circuit. Three men got out with guns and sprayed the lot with bullets. Smashing windows, punching bullet holes in nearly a dozen vehicles. The owner, whose identity CBC News is protecting for his safety, discovered the damage the next morning. I felt something under my shoes and I saw bullet shells. So I looked around, I saw more than 30, 40 bullet shells all over the place. Days before, there had been a threatening call to his business partner, demanding money. We were trying to figure out if it's a real or not, if it's a prank call. Right after the shooting, the threats continued. A few hours later, we got a call again that now you saw the result, now get the money ready. He reported it all to police, who told him to change his habits, even suggested hiring security. When we go out, we need to look around, make sure there's nobody parked. We are minimizing our exposure in the society. In Peel region west of Toronto, there have been 35 extortion attempts since October, targeting South Asian businesses, many involving violence. The frequency and the cadence of these extortions is, uh, you know, is uh, unprecedented. Similar extortion attempts are emerging across the country. CBC News has cataloged dozens of cases since October. In Edmonton, drive-by shootings and more than a dozen arsons. In Abbotsford, BC, threatening letters sent to local businesses. In Peel, a task force made a handful of arrests, but the wider problem remains. Would you agree with, with, with that premise that we're still 
kind of grappling with who's driving this? We're, we're, we're developing a better understanding of, of where this is, uh, is coming from, whether it is a single source, multiple sources, um, uh, you know, more local uh, or you know, sort of, uh, you know, a more national or, you know, international. Andrew says the use of the encoded WhatsApp and the emergence of copycats looking for a quick buck have made things even more difficult. And there's multiple groups now um, doing this because it's such a relatively easy thing to do. It involves a phone call. The RCMP has also formed a task force and have started connecting the cases between provinces. So I can tell you that there's absolutely links, links to organized crime. The head of the task force says the investigation is international in scope. There's a lot of people out there providing what they believe is the reason behind why these extortions are occurring. And it relates to geopolitical issues, perhaps the government of India and so forth. Those are possibilities, of course, we're going to look at if that is in fact what is occurring. Even if the gangster are here, then India based journalist Jupinderjeet Singh has been covering India's gang culture for decades and says it's hard to pinpoint exactly where these calls are coming from and who's making them. A lot of gangsters are operating from jails, so it is quite possible that they make phone calls from here to Canada. And why are they calling uh, Indians in Canada only? Why not other countries? Because there is some local network there. Police say these violent extortions have kept many victims silent. We think that there's likely people outside of the jurisdictions already reported and within these jurisdictions who may be victims and have not yet come forward. Some are simply choosing to pay rather than call the police. I can completely understand uh, the, the, you know, the level of fear and concern, but by, by paying, you're not making the problem go away. For the car dealer in Peel, the threats continue. A few weeks after shots were fired, a man walked into one of his dealerships. So basically he called somebody on WhatsApp, put it on the speaker, and they were trying to say, we need money or we'll come shoot you in the daytime. How much money are we talking about here? They were asking for 100000 I spent some time with you. you, you your phone rings a lot. Yeah. You don't ever answer it anymore. I only answer uh, if I have the number saved. I don't answer unknown, unknown calls anymore. Who knows who will be on the other end? So this crime wave won't be solved overnight. The head of the RCMP task force told Jamie this is an emerging issue that will take time and resources to stop. It is not something he'll be moving on from in six months. Next, an almost unimaginable baby gift from one of Canada's biggest artists. A life-changing surprise in our moment. So that's Bibi Gist and Jaime Jimenez. They're a couple from Kansas City. The sign they're holding up saying they're expecting their first baby in August led to a very different surprise over the weekend. So they took that sign to a Drake concert, hoping maybe he would interact with them. Well, he did a lot more than that. The unbelievable baby gift is our moment. I don't know what you need for your baby. You probably need like a nice crib, stroller, you know what I'm saying? Probably take your girl on a vacation. I'm gonna give you 20,000 for your girl. You know? I was just like, Speechless. Oh like the rest God. of the concert, we were just like. We went to the Drake concert uh, the second night when he was in Kansas City. There was no option Drake. that we were going to miss Drake. Oh, no, yeah. <laughs> you know, we made a little sign that says, hey, expect our first daughter in August and put her sonogram pictures. He came over to our side. He here. said, no, this right here is what I want to yeah. see. Where's, where's your girl at, brother? He was like, Where, uh, where's your girl at, man? And so I point to her. I was like, she's right here. <laughs> and he was like... I had like a quiver in my lip, and I'm like, oh. Expecting our first baby. Oh. And I was like, there's absolutely no way. I don't know what you need for your baby. You probably need like a nice crib. She pays you for $20,000. We want to be out of debt before our daughter gets here. And now this helps tremendously. Right, right, right. We're the biggest Drake fans you could think of. <laughs> My name on Instagram is Champagne Tico. His is Champagne Poppy. Like, I got his haircut. Drake's real name is Aubrey. And so I thought it was only fitting that we change our daughter's middle name to Aubrey. So that way we can honor him and uh, just have a piece of him with us forever. 
Wow, one day when someone asks her, hey, how did you get your middle name? Is she ever going to have a story? They've been fans of Drake since, of course, he was on, you know what, Degrassi, where? Right here. From all of us at The National, thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to The National's YouTube channel. I'm Adrian Arsenault. Take care.